Okay, so here I just summarized for you the main features of Fourier transport of 3D suspended coils, where a Fourier migration can occur either in an external uh, electric field, in external electric field, as in the case of electrophoresis, or in, inside concentration gradient of, of neutral solutes. Uh, here we talk about diffusophoresis, or when the particle is surrounded by a uh, uh, by a temperature gradient. For electrophoresis, the particle moves in the direction opposite to the electric field if its zeta potential is negative, while positively charged particle follows the direction of the electric field. For diffusophoresis, transport always occurs up the concentration gradient. And finally, for thermophoresis, the direction of the theoretic motion is given by the sign of the, of the sorry coefficient, where a migration towards the cold region, so in the case, so where uh, our sorry coefficient is positive, is typically much more common in the experiments. And the opposite essentially happens for fluid transport near a fixed surface, that is the case of of electrosmosis, diffusive osmosis, and thermosmosis. Okay, so we now come to the last part of my seminar, where we are going to use the, the knowledge we gain about fluidic transport, electrophoresis, diffusive and thermophoresis, in order to fabricate colloids that are able to move in autonomous fashion. The other step from phoresis to autophoresis or self-phoresis is fairly trivial. Instead of applying an external electric field, an external concentration gradient, or an external temperature gradient, we use particles that are equipped with surface patches, which interact with the medium and generate themselves this gradient or, or, or electric field. So a key aspect is that the gradient is local and move or rotate together with the particle. There are several ways in order uh, to prepare patchy colloidal particles, where one can either dry a monolayer of commercial beads on a glass slide and then deposit a layer of metal onto one hemisphere using an evaporation unit or a spatter quarter. And this can be done straight down or at an angle, as illustrated in, in this cartoon here, so that the coverage is controlled by shadowing effects. Or alternatively, one can confine the, the colloids at an interface, such as a wax water interface, and later functionalize only the, the side that is, that is exposed to one of the two phases. Here, for example, the side which is exposed to water. Or one can take uh, two or more colloids and merge them to make lobes that are made of different materials. This is also known as colloidal fusion. As, and there are also other methods, such as synthesis or microfluidic devices, as well as lithography. And I just stop here, since I have no more space in the slide. However, I don't want to focus on on these methods today, and here there is, there is a nice review for those who are interested. And we'll just assume that that, all, that these patchy particles, or also called Janus particles, when they are made of two hemispheres of, of different materials, are ready to be used, and so they are ready to go. And so I'm going to follow the order we use uh, in the case of Fourier transfer phenomena, and start with uh, electrophoresis. So here we saw that in classical electrophoresis, the particle move under an applied electric field, either this way or this other way, depending on the sign of its zeta potential. In self electrophoresis, it's exactly the same, but here the, uh, the electric field is generated by the particle itself. We have also seen that a transport in electric field also includes induced charge electrophoresis and induced charge electrosmosis, where an extra slippage 
stem from the electropolarizability of the particle. And these effects can be used in order to make active colors that are able to self propel in this direction or this other direction, while an electric field is applied perpendicular to the polymer motion. So here I want to emphasize here that we still need an electric field. However, this configuration on the bottom uh, on the bottom right of the slide, um, where the electric field and the slip velocity are perpendicular one to the other, would never lead to uh, to any propulsion uh, in the case of classical induced charge electrophoresis and induced charge electrosmosis. The best example of, of self-electrophoretic colors are, are bimetallic swimmers, uh, are bimetallic particles in aqueous solution which are enriched with hydrogen peroxide. These are also the first realization of, of synthetic active particle, with uh, this article from 2004, which uh, has now more than 1,700 citations. These microswimmers were rods that are made of, of platinum and gold segments, which were able to swim in this water hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide solution at velocities of a few microseconds. Even though later many other similar designs have been proposed, see for example this review, to, um, in order to achieve velocities as large as hundreds of microns per second. So here, this, uh, uh, this gold and platinum rods behave as, uh, as batteries, where the, where the hydrogen peroxide is decomposed by an oxidation reaction on the platinum side, and is recombined on the, on, on the gold end by a reduction reaction. This leads to these two diffuse clouds of counter ions, one with a positive and one with a negative charge density, and therefore to an internal electric field which point this way. Since the roads, since the roads have a have a net negative surface charge, so they have a zeta potential, which is smaller than zero. According to what we saw about electrophoretic transport, the slip velocity self-propelled the particle towards the platinum segment, so in this direction. And the slip velocity is given by this formula. Where the, where the electric field, it's important to keep in mind, that is now internal, and depends on the distance between the two clouds of counter ions, which is roughly equal to the length of the rod. Uh, it depends on the thickness, which is given by the Debye layer. And more importantly, also depends on the proton flux, which in turn can be adjusted by, by increasing the peroxide, uh, the hydrogen peroxide concentration of the solution. Or it can even boost it if we add carbon nanotubes inside the platinum segment. On the other hand, if we put an insulator between the, the, the two sides, then the proportion then the proportion of of these nano rods ends. A second strategy in order to make active colloids that are driven by electrophoretic slippage is to place patchy particles in an electric field that oscillate in a direction perpendicular to the plane where we want to uh, where we want the active motion of the particles to take place. Uh, uh, experimentally, this method is very practical since one can put a colloidal suspension between two electrodes, which uh, which are, for example, two gold-coated glass lights or um, or indium um substrates, and these electrodes are are separated by a, a spacer, and then we can let the colors sink to the bottom substrate, 
microscope and observe the active motion in this place using a microscope. However, it took me a while to understand exactly why these what is Janus or patchy particles are able to swim, and which are the experimental knobs which one needs to tune. The reason why it took me a while is that the mechanism of proportion and therefore the requirements which are needed to achieve it strongly depends on the frequency omega of the of the applied electric field. And this is also why I try to emphasize before the importance of the charging time when I presented in the cases of induced charge electrosmosis and induced charge electrophoresis. Uh, at small frequencies that are typically smaller than 10 kilo, a subproportion is often um, is, is typically caused by induced charge electrosmosis near um, one of the two electrodes. To explain this, this method, think of what we said earlier about the electrosmotic recirculating rows when we have bands of different surface charge and apply an electric field in this direction. And now apply this idea to uh, the situation where, where here one of the band is, uh, is the conductive electrode, and the other band is, for example, an homogeneous, an homogeneous dielectric particle which sits on it. So here we now have recirculating rows between the, the particle and, and the substrate. And this row goes either clockwise or counterclockwise depending on the surface charge of these two materials. These rows are able to lead to, uh, to aggregation of colloidal particles, as shown in this, in this article here. However, they are symmetric, so they do not trigger any net motion. However, if we now break the symmetry by using two hemispheres or two lobes, which are made of two materials with different dielectric properties, the magnitude of, of, the, of the electrosmotic rows, or even the direction of them, might be different, which is the condition we need in order to achieve a net proportion of the, of the colloidal particle on top of the conductive surface. Uh, importantly, why we need to, be to, to work close to an, to an electrode for this mechanism to take place, these two materials can be anything, and, and they, don't have, they don't have to be necessarily uh, a metal, as long as they have a different surface charge. Uh, so the, you know, the slip velocity, as we've seen in the case of induced charge electrosmosis, increases with the with the with the electric field squared, as shown also in this video here, and also depends on the on the combination between the two materials of the either the two hemispheres or in this example here of two lobes. Uh, also, since the particles are, uh, are driven by unbalanced electrosmotic flows near the underlying conductive surface, we need to make sure that the, the frequency of the electric field is small enough so that the electrical double layer of the, uh, of the electrode is able to form entirely or at least partially. This is the typical charging time of the electrode. It's the same as the one we saw uh, for particle, except that here we use the cell thickness instead of the particle radius. This charging time is often of the order of 100 Hertz, so that, uh, that our subproportion sub due to induced charge electrosmosis works in these two regions where the electro double layer is, is fully built up, or where we have only a partial build up of, 
of the screening clouds. On the other hand, if the uh, if the operating frequency is too is too low, we run into other problems such as the fact that uh, the the magnitude of the electric field at the edge of the polarization layer is too small, and we also have Faraday reaction across the electrode. So, in practice, in a, the experiment of induced charge electrosmosis. Um, um, of induced charge to small of proportion are done in a frequency range where we typically have a partial buildup of the electrical double layer of of, of the conductive substrate of the conductive substrate. So if we have partial buildup, uh, we our slip velocity uh, is going to decrease. Is going to decrease as we increase the operating frequency. As shown in this plot here. If, on the other hand, we go at even higher frequency, then uh, induced charge electrosmosis becomes essentially negligible, essentially at zero. However, a net motion can be still obtained if we use particles that are coated with a metal, near which uh, the induced charge, the induced charge slip flow is strong enough to sustain the subproportion of, of these collider particles. Uh, here, the setup looks uh, exactly the same as before, but the particle do not necessarily need to be close to the electrode in order to swim. Although, uh, if we have a, a particle that is coated with a heavy metal, such as, for example, titanium or, or gold, they are heavy and they will naturally sink to the bottom substrate. And like in the case of induced charge electrosmosis, also for induced charge electrophoresis, that is this mechanism here, the slip velocity increases with the electric field square that is applied in the perpendicular direction. However, the main difference is that now the particles are propelled, are driven by their own slip flow. So the operating frequencies are now compared to the charging time of the particle. Since our particle is now the important double layer capacitor. And So here, uh, analogously of what we've seen before, if the operating frequency is smaller than the inverse of the charging time of the particle, so here note we have the particle radius, we have a full buildup of the electrical double layer. Then uh, at frequencies that, that, that are comparable to this charging time, we have a partial buildup. And finally, if the frequency is much larger than, than this charge in time and, and, and becomes comparable to the inverse of, of the typical diffusion time of the ions across the bilayer thickness, then in this situation we have no buildup at all and therefore we will can't have any cell proportion. So, in due, so cell proportion due to induced charge electrophoresis works in these two regions. However, as more frequencies, the electromotic flows, which we've seen just, just in the past slides, they typically dominate. So, in practice, experiments of active colloids driven by induced charge electrophoresis are done in this region, where then the slip velocity decreases with the applied frequencies. Uh, as you can see, there is also something strange that happens at frequencies that are larger than 100 kilohertz. And what happens is that uh, the that 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 in this region, the direction of motion changes, and some proportions start to occur with a metal heading instead of with uh, instead of with the electric hemispheres heading. 
The reason for this reversal or reverse induced charge electrophoresis uh, is actually unclear, but it's somewhat related to diffusion time of ions across the particle perimeter. Across the particle perimeter. Um, I think there has been a lot of speculation. However, I'm not aware of any um, any conclusive experimental or, or theory about that. Okay, we now move on uh, with our list. And we've seen that uh, homogeneous particles migrate up a concentration gradient of solutes due to diffuse Fourier transport. If we, if we switch from diffuse phoresis to self diffuse phoresis, this means that particles uh, are able to generate themselves this concentration gradient by means of some sort of reactive sites. Uh, one or several reactive sites on the surface of the colloid. And here think, for example, of a bed which is equipped with an enzymatic patch, which is able to produce some sort of product particles at, at a given reaction rate. In experiment, the, the most popular example of allegedly self diffusophoretic particles are catalytic colors that are similar to the to bimetallic gold platinum particle in hydrogen peroxide solution, but in which the gold side here is replaced with an with an inert material such as a, a silica or, or polystyrene. And here there is no longer a, any reduction reaction, and therefore there is no longer any electric field. But only we, we are only dealing with the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide in the vicinity of the platinum cap. So we have gradients of reactants and reaction products in this direction, and the particles self propel along the axis that link the poles of the two hemispheres uh, at velocities that is typically given by the concentration of hydrogen peroxide in the bulk. So experiment with these type of particles are very simple, and I will show you an example uh, during the exercise part of this lecture. So and here it's enough to spot up some platinum onto one hemisphere of the colloid, then put them into a water hydrogen peroxide solution, let them sediment onto the bottom substrate of an observation cell, and look at how they move using a commercial a conventional microscope. The particles, as I, as I said, are faster and faster as we increase the hydrogen peroxide concentration. The fact that the experiments are so easy made the system very popular across several groups studying artificial active matter. However, in, uh, in spite of this, there are still many open questions which concern the underlying proportion mechanism. Uh, if we believe that the only thing that happens is that the composition of hydrogen peroxide in water and oxygen are triggered by the, plat by, by the platinum as a catalyst, then uh, we can say that our particle generates gradients of oxygen uh, in this direction and hydrogen peroxide in this other direction. So here, and here we have no ions that are involved uh, uh, in the mechanism, and transport can only occur via neutral diffusophoresis. Uh, uh, also, the fact that experiments show that the particles swim with the uncoated hemisphere heading uh, implies that, following the argument we introduced for neutral diffusophoresis, the colleagues prefers a hydrogen peroxide over uh, oxygen. Since, if you remember what we said before, uh, uh, a colloidal particle always migrates in the direction of the preferred solute. This, this velocity is proportional 
to the absorption length, to an effective absorption length square, inversely proportional to the viscosity of the medium, and also proportional to the concentration of hydrogen peroxide in bulk. Well, here the proportionality constant uh, uh, increases with the reaction rate, that is the rate at which the hydrogen peroxide is decomposed across the platinum cap, and uh, is invert and, and decreases with the diffusivity of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, in fact, if we increase this ratio, the gradient of H2O2 of, of, of H2 across the particle becomes steeper and steeper, whereas uh, if um, uh, the hydrogen peroxide diffuses faster, then this gradient are smeared out due to this diffusivity. And this simple model seems to explain the linear increase of, of, of uh, swimming velocity with the bulk concentration of, of hydrogen peroxide. However, it doesn't explain the fact that, that the swimming velocity saturates at large H2O2 concentrations. In order to explain this effect, we need to consider that uh, that the, the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide does not happen exactly this way, but it happens in two steps at two speeds or two reaction rates. So an effective reaction rate must be considered in order to uh, in order to in order to calculate the, the, the slip velocity of the particle. So if we use this model, instead of a, a single reaction rate, we are able to reproduce the fact that the, slip, the fact that the swimming velocity reaches a plateau. And so far, everything seems to be reasonable enough However, recent experiments show that the magnitude of the swimming velocities calls for a large value of, um, of slip length, of lambda, which is not really compatible with absorption processes that are due to van der Waals or excluded volume interactions. It seems, in fact, that a more complicated mechanisms start coming to play and contribute to the sub proportion, including ionic sun diffuser freezes, which is due to ionic dissociation of hydrogen peroxide, as well as local electric fields that are similar to those we saw in bimetallic swimmers, but that are caused by inhomogeneities in the, the uh, coating of the particle. Uh, all in all, we reported that the proportional velocity changes by more than one order of magnitude depending on the experiment, on experimental tweaks, such as whether we evaporate or sputter the, the platinum coating, or, or whether we use stabilized or non-stabilized hydrogen peroxide. So obviously this uh, tells us that the mechanism of self proportion of these catalytic swimmers is full of subtle and unexplored details. And I think that, um, and I think that you will see more details in the lecture of Julian Sinking. Okay, we have now come to the last type of autophoretic particle I want to talk about today. The are particle that are driven, that are self driven due to self thermophoretic. In classical thermophoresis, colloidal particles move toward a cold or hot region depending on the sign of the atmospheric coefficient, and we have seen it in the last minute. On the other hand, self thermophoretic particles are able to generate themselves a thermal gradient in the surrounding under an external illumination because they are partly coated with a light absorbing material. A typical example is that of silica particles that are half coated with few nanometers of gold, 
are dispersed in water and illuminated by a laser beam. Here the gold hemisphere absorbs light, heats up, and establishes a local temperature gradient, which is a function of the absorption cross-section of the, the cap, the illumination intensity I, the thermal conductivity, and the particle size, which obviously gives also the size of the, of the light absorbing area. As a result, the slip velocity follows what we said about thermophoresis and is proportional to the gradient of temperature times the SORE coefficient times the diffusion coefficient of the particle. Well, here the sign of well, here the sign of this SORE coefficient can be uh, interestingly changed by adding surfactant, which leads to either the color swimming towards the, the gold side or, um, or with the uncoated hemisphere heading. And the great advantage of this method is that this temperature difference and therefore this velocity can be tuned in situ by adjusting the illumination power. However, the drawback is that the intensity which are required to obtain slip velocity that are of the order of a few micro per seconds are fairly large, which means that either one look at the motion within a very small, a very small area, in this particular uh, experiment, 8 to 10 micro, or one finds uh, um, a way to follow the particle with a laser beam using a Feynman mechanism. On the other hand, smaller illumination intensity can be used to drive particle uh, um, to, uh, sorry, to activate the cell proportion of colloidal particle, provided that the proportional mechanism is different from thermophoresis. So here we are no longer talking about thermophoresis or soft thermophoresis. We're talking about other uh, mechanisms of propulsion which are driven by light. Uh, here, for example, one can disperse colloids in a binary mixture, which is characterized by a lower critical temperature, so that uh, uh, heating, a low, heating a cap triggers a local demixing um, uh, in, the, uh, in the fluid next to the cotton hemisphere. Or one, uh, uh, or one can use swimmers in uh, a hydrogen peroxide solution, that's what we saw before, but where the catalytic reaction is only actuated upon uh, light illumination. Uh, here, uh, uh, hematite uh, is used in place of platinum, and, and hematite triggers the, the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide under illumination with UV or uh, with ultraviolet light. Uh, or finally, one can place colloids at a liquid interface, such as a water, air, or a water oil interface, and promote Marangoni stresses under illumination with laser light. You will hear about this experiment, I assume, I guess. In Lucio, in Lucio Caesar's lecture. So finally, I summarize here the type of micro swimmers we have looked into in the last uh, in the last half an hour or so. Their proportion mechanism and the main requirements in case you are interested in setting up an experiment. And note that all micro swimmers must be patchy, so this is a requirement which applies to us. Or all this to all these methods. This leads me to the conclusion of, of this lecture. So in the part in the last hour, hour and a half, we saw that uh, slip flows are able to promote direct ferritic transport of micro and nanoparticle in electric field, in concentration gradient of neutral or charged carbonyl species, and uh, in uh, ingredients of temperature. Uh, so after that, we have replicated this type of of, of, um, of interfacial transport in an autonomous fashion, where autoferritic motion is achieved 
where local, where local gradients are autonomously produced by particles that are equipped with surface patches. Uh, so here are some interesting review about the topics. These two are about uh, uh, about fluid transport in small channels. These are uh, these two are very interesting review on phoretic and subphoretic phenomena. Whereas these are more specific on thermophoresis, induced charge at osmosis and induced charge at osmosis, and catalytic microswimmers. Uh, you find all these references in the notes which I uploaded online, together with other articles that I deem are that I deem are of interest. And uh, I thank you for watching the video, and I look forward to discuss with you online.